How to reverse insulin resistance. Is that even something that can be done? A lot of conditions traditionally are viewed as irreversible. Oftentimes when people get a diagnosis of diabetes, then they hear that, oh, you're going to take this medication and you're going to take it for the rest of your life and it's probably going to get worse. And the same thing with blood pressure and, and many other things that are considered chronic. But I think the problem is that most doctors don't understand the mechanism properly and they also assume that people are incapable or unwilling to do the necessary changes to reverse the condition. What they are forgetting is that the body is not stupid, it is not random. The body is very, very intelligent and if something gets out of balance, it's because we are pushing the body out of balance. We have introduced something, we have done something to create that imbalance and the body is just doing what it's supposed to. So if we change some things to undo what we did to create the imbalance, the body will follow suit and the body will establish balance and the body will heal. But that is almost an unknown concept because once you go and you get your medication, you're often told that you'll be on it forever. But by the time you finish watching this video, you will understand enough that you know more than most doctors about insulin resistance and you will know that it can be helped and you'll know how to do it. Coming right up. I'm Dr. Ekberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. It can be a little discouraging to try to research how to get healthy on the internet because 99% of the information is about disease. It's about how to treat disease, how to treat symptoms, what conditions are called. There's very little information on how to actually get healthy, to understand the mechanisms and to understand how to improve them. So when I typed in insulin resistance, the first thing that pops up is that it says resistance to the hormone insulin resulting in increasing blood sugar. And on the surface that statement looks reasonable, but it's backwards because it's assuming, it says resistance to the hormone insulin. Who is resisting? Well, it's the cells of the body. And now we're assuming that those cells are stupid and they're just not doing what they're supposed to and because they're being resistant, that's why the blood sugar increases. That's backwards. It's the constant high blood sugar that results in the cells becoming resistant. But if we don't realize that, then we're always going to treat the end result as the problem. Next statement is that treatment can help, but insulin resistance can't be cured. Then they say it's a chronic condition, it's a lifelong condition. In other words, take your pill and don't ever stop. And finally, they throw in their clever two cents at the end. Weight loss and exercise can help reduce insulin resistance. So let's talk about this, but we're going to, we're going to come back to this, but first we're going to give you a different picture, a different analogy of how this really works. When we eat something, it is absorbed in the bloodstream. That's the purpose. We eat something, it is broken down, absorbed in the blood, and then the fat, the protein, and the carbohydrates are absorbed into the bloodstream for fuel and building blocks. Carbohydrates create the strongest insulin response because they raise blood sugar the most. When blood sugar goes up, insulin comes in, insulin is released to assist, to guide the blood sugar in, out of the bloodstream and into the cell. That's the purpose of insulin. When we eat protein, it creates a mild to moderate insulin response and when we eat fat, then it creates almost zero insulin response in itself. So even though all food creates an insulin response, we're going to focus on carbs because 
they create a many times stronger insulin response. We eat some carbohydrates and they create blood sugar. So we're going to represent the whole vascular system, the whole volume of blood with this container. Think of it as a jug and it can only hold so much. And in the case of blood sugar, even though the blood volume is relatively high, it can only hold about one teaspoon at a time. The excess needs to get into the cells as quickly as possible and that's where insulin comes in. Then the cells receive the blood sugar and it, the cell uses what it needs to out of that glucose, out of that sugar. It converts the rest into glycogen and then fat. So again, think of these as containers and the cells can hold a whole lot more than the blood. The blood can only hold, like I said, a teaspoon, which is 20 calories. The cells can hold about 1500 calories of glycogen and they can hold hundreds of thousands of calories of fat. But that's the sequence of things. If we eat a lot of carbs and we fill up the blood sugar and then the blood sugar spills over and think of these as, as hoses. So here's a little pipeline coming from the blood sugar and it's dumping the sugar into the cell. By the time this container is full, then it has to start converting the sugar to glycogen and the sugar into fat and then the fat eventually starts spilling over and gets stored. So this starts often in the liver and then by the time those cells are full and it's called fatty liver, then they start spilling outwards and that's where they spill into the surrounding tissue and you get this belly fat. You get a, a large belly, you get most of your weight on the midsection. That's a result of this process. Now again, not everyone who has insulin resistance gains weight, but for the most part, people do. So when they say that the cell is resistant to the hormone insulin, that's like blaming the container for being full. We, we have this mountain of carbs and we're creating these pipelines and we're filling up the cells and the, the jug can only hold a gallon, but we're trying to get two gallons in there and we're blaming the container because it becomes resistant. It starts saying, hey, I'm full. I don't want any more. I can't hold any more. And that's why the blood sugar increases because it has no place to go. But when we look at this, it sounds like the problem is the cell resisting insulin and that results in the increasing blood sugar. When it's the other way around, it's the excess of carbs that we're dumping into the blood sugar that is filling up the container. The container can only do so much. When it's full, it's full. All right? So let's look at the next statement. Treatment can help. What does that mean? What is treatment? So first of all, they got the picture backwards. They think the blood sugar is the problem rather than the cells or the carbs. So treatment consists only exclusively of trying to lower the blood sugar. So now they can do that with metformin. They can do it with different drugs to make the cell more insulin sensitive to tell the cell, hey, stop resisting. So we're tricking the cell into accepting more, but it doesn't solve the problem because the cell is still full. So all we're doing is with treatment, that's like adding more hoses, adding more pipelines, adding some, some pressurized hoses so we can force more stuff into that cell. It's already bloating, it's already uh, bursting at the seams, but we got, if we think the blood sugar is the problem, then we're just gonna keep trying to empty the blood sugar container into the cells, whatever it takes, just force it more and more and more. And eventually, when we've asked the body to make so much insulin that we reach a point where the pancreas can't keep up, now we start injecting insulin, which again is just making, adding 
more hoses, more pipeline, pushing more and more stuff into that poor cell that's already full. The jug is full. It's been overflowing for years. And all we can think to do is to push more stuff into that cell. And that's what treatment consists of. So treatment, when they say treatment can help, what they mean is that we can do things to lower the blood sugar. We can pump enough insulin or enough medication to lower that blood sugar, paying no attention to what's going on over here, paying no attention to the fact that now as a result, we raise the blood sugar, we increase the abdominal obesity, we create cardiovascular disease, we raise triglycerides, we create metabolic syndrome as a result of forcing the blood sugar into the cell. Never for once thinking that maybe we shouldn't put so many carbs into the blood sugar. And if we understand then what the treatment is and what they consider help is, then of course insulin resistance can't be cured because we're ignoring the source of the problem and the end result of the problem. We're just looking at the intermediary and defining that as the problem. And of course, if we ignore the cause, then it's going to be a chronic and lifelong condition. And I don't know if I'm going to laugh or cry every time I see this last statement. Weight loss and exercise can help reduce insulin resistance. That Yes, exercise is a good thing. Do it, do it a lot. The exercising muscle is less insulin resistant, so it is one small component, but exercise in itself has virtually no effect unless you start reversing the abuse of the system, the chronic loading, overloading of the system. But when they say things like weight loss, can help reduce insulin resistance. They're falling into the trap of thinking that weight causes the problems. Weight is the result of the problem. So it's like, it, it's not very helpful. It's like telling someone, if you want a long life, then don't die. If you want to live a really, really long time, you should consider avoiding death. If you avoid dying, then you live longer. See, it's, it's a circular reasoning that's so obvious, it's ridiculous. But so often we hear that, oh, if you just lose some weight, what they're telling you there is that if you would only have some character, if you would only eat less calories, you would lose weight and they're forgetting the bigger picture. They don't understand that there's a reason the body is holding on to the weight called insulin resistance. There is a reason that you get hungry called insulin resistance. There's a reason that your body prefers to store away the fat in the cells rather than using them for fuel called insulin resistance. So again, they get it totally, totally backwards. And we need to start understanding that this is an overloading problem. It is not a blood sugar problem. And what are we overloading? We're overloading the things that stimulate insulin. So if you understand this model, then you can see how every one of these statements is backwards and ignorant. And ignorant not meaning stupid, just uninformed. They've got the wrong paradigm. They've got the wrong picture. And I never really understood how horrendous the official guidelines are. I've always quoted these numbers. I've, I've read through, I've glanced at the USDA, the recommended guidelines for food. And I've quoted these numbers that, oh, on a 2,000 calorie diet, you should eat they, they claim that you should eat 300 grams of carbs, which is 60% of your caloric intake from carbs. And if you look at any food label, if you look at the very bottom when they recommend this much fat and this much carbs, etc., uh, it says 300 grams of carbs on a 2,000 calorie diet. And that's 
an unbelievably high number, but it doesn't even tell the truth about how bad that is. So number one, they recommend 60% carbs, but then I studied the official guidelines a little closer and in there it also speaks about two cups of fruit per day because everyone knows how good you have to eat fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables. Yes, plant food is good to a point, but they say two cups of fruit and it should be fresh, frozen, canned or juiced or dried. So if you take a combination of all those and you have two cups of fruit, that's about 75 grams of sugar per day just from the fruit. And yes, it's a little more natural than the table sugar, but it's still sugar. And half of that is still fructose. And half of that is still going to jam those cells in the liver and create a fatty liver. If you're not insulin resistant, if you never had processed foods, then yes, you could probably eat some fruit. I think you should eat fresh fruit. I don't think you should eat two cups every day, but you could definitely have some fruit. But by the time you have insulin resistance and you eat fruit with a total of 75 grams of sugar per day, that's a death sentence to that liver. It is not going to recover on that load. Then they tell you to eat three cups of dairy per day. And of course, non-fat dairy. And no, the fat is the only thing that would slow down the insulin response a little bit. But now that we have non-fat, fat-free dairy, now there's only protein and sugar, which stimulate insulin. If we had the whole fat dairy or if we had cream or half and half or sour cream, then the fat would slow down the sugar absorption a bit and it would actually be a better food. So three cups of dairy, it's about 40 grams of milk sugar. So we don't get the fructose in there, but it's still going to have sugar to spike the blood sugar. And then they say that, oh, table sugar, added sugar, that's not a good thing. So you want to eat less than 10% of your total caloric intake from sugar, added sugar. So 10% is 200 calories or 50 grams of sugar. So if you add that up, that's 165 grams of sugar per day, and you have not eaten any candy bars or any ice cream or any soda. Astonishing numbers. It completely blew my mind when I looked closer at those numbers. And no wonder we're in the shape that we're in. So if you understand this model, that it's not a blood sugar problem, it's an overloading problem, it's pressurizing, it's just pushing more and more stuff into the cells, and that when we push with primarily carbs, then we trigger insulin and insulin is the storage, it's the pushing hormone. Then it becomes pretty obvious that all we have to do is do the opposite of this. Those cells would start burning off all that stored fuel if they got a chance. If we stopped doing the things that trigger insulin, we would give that cell a chance to stop overflowing. So the first thing you want to do is to cut out sugar. And why? Because sugar is 50% glucose, 50% fructose. The glucose increases blood sugar, stimulates insulin. The fructose jams up the liver. And remember, this represents the, all the body cells, but primarily the liver because it's the metabolic factory and it's the first place that gets all the food and it's the only place that can process the fructose, which is 50% of all that sugar. So cut sugar. Then you want to reduce your carbs. And so often we hear, oh, don't eat sugar, but eat complex carbs. Eat bread and pasta and rice. Well, they don't understand when they say that, that there is no difference in the blood sugar response. There's like that much difference because the complex carbs, the starches, they're just like long strings of sugar molecules. And it takes the body minutes, not hours, it takes minutes 
for the body to start breaking up those chains and turning that complex carb, turning that complex chain into individual sugars. So complex carbs are in average about 10-15 minutes away from becoming sugar and that's why the rice and the bread and the potatoes have about the same impact on blood sugar as pure table sugar. So complex carbs, they're a fallacy if you think that they're going to help reduce this, this problem. The next thing you want to do is to eat fewer meals. So if you do this six times a day, if you're eating food that trigger insulin, you raise your blood sugar, you're filling up the pipeline, you're pushing stuff into the cell, if you do that six times a day, every couple of hours while you're awake, you're not giving that cell a chance to undo the overloading. Insulin is pushing it in and it needs time to start burning through some of those reserves, some of those stores. They're, they're, the fuel is packed everywhere, but they never get a chance to burn anything off because there's always more coming in. And that's what happens when you eat three meals a day with snacks and, and you have little bites of, of things along your day. So you want to eat fewer meals. And another word for that is intermittent fasting. So I would suggest if you eat three meals with snacks, then start cutting the sugar, start cutting the carbs, and then as you increase your protein and fat, you won't be so hungry and you can eliminate those snacks. Then as you go this, take this a little bit further, you'll find that you probably won't be so hungry even for three meals. Three meals will seem like a lot. And whichever meal you don't feel like eating, just skip it. For most people, that is breakfast. And, but whatever works for you, just give it a try. And then you eat probably twice a day. And then you start putting those two meals closer together. So first you might eat at noon and at eight in the evening. So then you have eight hours between the meals. And that means you're fasting for 16 hours between dinner and lunch. Then you can, you can push that a few hours. And if you now have the dinner, you push it back to six o'clock, you have a six hour feeding window and an 18 hour fasting window. So the longer you go between meals, the more you give those cells a chance to start using up some of that stored fuel. Number four, exercise. Exercise is a good thing. It increases the cells opportunity to burn through some of the fuel, but it also increases the insulin sensitivity of the muscles. The working muscle does not require any or nearly as much insulin to get the glucose into the cell because the working muscle is kind of sucking the glucose out of the bloodstream. So exercise is a good thing. I've done some videos on that so you can look into more detail. Number five, you want to de-stress. So many people today are stressed and what happens with stress is you're in a fight-flight situation and the body is going to do everything it can to raise blood sugar to give you enough fuel to handle the fight and when blood sugar goes up so does insulin so stress and cortisol actually increases insulin resistance directly do some meditation, do some breathing exercises, whatever it takes, get some exercise, chill out, whatever it takes. This might seem a bit harsh, but do the opposite of the recommended guidelines. Whatever the USDA and the Mayo Clinic and all those people say, pretty much do the opposite because in their guidelines, they tell you to eat 165 grams of sugar every day and that is not going to get you healthy. That is not going to reduce your insulin resistance. There is no amount of exercise that is going to create a permanent solution. This is kind of what they tried with The Biggest Loser. And the vast majority of those people, any, any one of those people who can't keep working out six, seven hours a day, 
gained all the weight back because they crashed their metabolism, they didn't reduce their insulin resistance, they lowered their basal metabolic rate, and they lost the weight as long as they could put the system, put their body into an emergency of just exercising all day long and starving it. Everything works for a while, but if you can't maintain it and if you can't help that cell become less insulin resistant, then the intervention is temporary. So insulin resistance is reversible. Once you've been severely insulin resistant, you'll probably have a tendency to go in that direction for the rest of your life, but it doesn't mean that you have to be insulin resistant. It just means you can probably never pig out completely like some people can, but then that doesn't mean those people are healthy either because thin people get lupus and arthritis and diabetes and heart disease too. So we have to not look at the weight or any of the symptoms. We have to look at what is health? What does the body require to be healthy? If you're new to the channel and you enjoy this sort of content, make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell. And please share this information because so many people out there need this. The vast majority of the Western world is insulin resistant and they still think it's a blood sugar problem. They think they still the solution is to jam more stuff into the cells instead of less and helping the body burn through some of that. Thanks for watching.